Good evening. From all over the globe where we travel, <clears throat> we are hearing students say now, not that they want to come to Hawaii, but that they want to come to Maui. <clears throat> and they want to know why the Maui tapes are so different. And I explain as best I can that there is a spirit, there is a spirit on Maui, <clears throat> different than uh, other places. And of course, there is. To understand it, it would be necessary to understand more of the working of the spiritual kingdom, the spiritual universe. <clears throat> Very little, almost nothing, has been written on that subject because the few who have discovered it realize how impossible it is to explain it to explain it to those who haven't experienced it. It must be clear, to you at least, <clears throat> that there are individuals who have gone beyond ordinary human living. That is, individuals who have become inspired from a higher source. We think offhand of Moses and Elijah, Jesus, John, Paul, the Buddha, Lao Tzu, Nanak, Shankara. These are all individuals who were spiritually endowed far beyond uh, the limits of any mortal man. And there have been hundreds, there have been thousands of others who in greater or lesser or equal degree have received illumination from a higher source than the human race. The human race is uh, slightly above the animal and is approaching uh, a readiness for civilization. It hasn't yet reached a place where it can actually receive uh, civilization except in a minor degree because it still lives by self-preservation. Strike the other man before he strikes you. Let the buyer beware. <clears throat> These are the outstanding traits of humanity. And it is only in a minor measure that you are finding the subject of brotherly love entering human consciousness. that progress has been made is evident. For instance, I have told you uh, not to take seriously 
all of this uh, civil rights business that's in the press as if they meant it, as if there were any serious attempt uh, to bring about equality, justice, and so forth. Whatever tiny measure may creep in will be by accident, not by design or by evolution. But here and there, you will notice that a serious effort is being introduced into human consciousness to bring this subject into fulfillment. <clears throat> Those of you who have access to Saturday Review of Literature will find in it the experience of Richmond, Virginia. And here you will see how civil rights has not only been introduced but brought to expression by people not politically influenced but actually influenced by something far beyond uh, human experience. So it is that in every walk of life today, you will find the civilized state of consciousness more and more being introduced into the human. Now, <clears throat> this all goes back to the fact that throughout all ages, there have been those spiritually endowed. Paul shows you the difference when he speaks of man of earth, man who has his being in Christ, or the creature who is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be, or the son of God who is God-governed, God-endowed. Now, <clears throat> When a spiritually endowed individual, no, let us go back first, when humans pass from this scene by what we call death or passing on, they enter an experience just as human as the one they left. And the proof of this is that from the very beginning of the discovery of spiritualism, that is, the ability to contact those who have passed, up to this very moment, all of the contacts that have been made have been made with the same state of consciousness of those who left here. In other words, whatever their interests were on earth, their interests remain. <clears throat> this should not be difficult for you to understand because you have caught a glimpse of the word consciousness. Now, you know what I mean when I speak of consciousness. You close your eyes for a moment and just say the word I. I, meaning whoever you are, I, Joel, I, Emma, I, Kit, I, Doc. Now this I that you have declared is you. You know that this is not your body. This is you. This is you yourself. In whatever state of consciousness you may be at this moment, but this is you, and this you is invisible. This you I cannot see out here. All I can see is your form, but I cannot see you. You are somewhere in the back looking out at me through your eyes, but you are invisible. No one can ever see your nature, your character, 
the measure of your education, the measure of your civilization. No one can see that, hear it, taste it, touch it, or smell it. That is you, invisible you. And it is this you which when the body dies, goes right on living. This you, which is already invisible, it doesn't have to leave your body, it isn't in it. It doesn't have to become invisible, it is already invisible. It remains invisible and it remains where it is now. You have all been through the exercise of mentally going from your toenails up to the topmost hair on your head and you have already discovered that you are not there. You are not inside of your body. And enough surgeons have operated enough people to know that they have never discovered anybody inside the body. Therefore, you are not in the body now and you will never leave the body. You will remain where you are now, regardless of what may happen to the body. Now, <clears throat> whether you are sitting there with or without the body, you are still what you are. And to have communion with you, to speak with you or listen to you, would bring forth from you whatever your present state of consciousness is, whether in the body or out. That is, whether visible or not. So it is that by the act of dying or by the act of passing on, you do not become any better than you are now or any worse. You remain what you are now, the state of consciousness you are now, and therefore, if I were to contact you, if I were to have communion with you, you would respond the same as you would if you were visible as form. You would not have risen higher in consciousness, nor been lower, except that those who are quite far along on the spiritual path would be advanced, even by the act of passing. Now, those who have attained a measure of the fourth dimension of consciousness, those who, like the masters of the world, have attained some measure of their masterhood here, they do not become a part of that spiritualistic life or assemblage, but they go immediately beyond it into what is their native or attained fourth dimensional consciousness. And I mean by this that to contact a human being on passing would be to find that you are in communion or communication with a human being and you would get human answers to human questions. Whereas, no one could make contact with those on the spiritual level unless they themselves had attained some measure of that spiritual level and then they would be in contact with that consciousness. Now, it is a fact that there are certain places on earth that still feel the effects of those who have attained spiritual heights. In other words, I have come in close contact with it in Scotland, in Damascus, <clears throat> in 
Others have come in contact with it in Jerusalem. Some have come in contact with it in India. But there are places known to be influenced by a consciousness beyond that of the human. You will recall, of course, the uh, term that is used here so much, the spirit of aloha. Now, now just think for a moment what is meant by the spirit of aloha. It is nothing human. It really means that there is some kind of a spirit, not merely among the Hawaiian people. They were just as much of fighters before the white race came here as uh, they were afterwards. But everyone who comes here seems eventually to take on some measure of that spirit of aloha. And that spirit of aloha is a friendly spirit beyond the ordinary human because it enables people to smile at each other on the street without being accused of flirting. It enables people to give gifts to each other without having the feeling that they're being bribed or bought. It enables people to give and receive gifts without the feeling that they're being embarrassed or imposed upon. There is something that is called a very definite something, something real, that is called the spirit of aloha. So, there is something very real that is called the spirit or divine consciousness. So that when this spirit or consciousness touches the master, he is enabled to say, I am ordained of God. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me and I am ordained to heal the sick. Something specific has happened in a specific moment. Look at him outwardly, he still looks like a Hebrew rabbi, clothes like a Hebrew rabbi, probably talks like a Hebrew rabbi, but there is something different about him. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Take Saul of Tarsus, a well-read Hebrew, a, a learned Hebrew, in the letter of truth, <clears throat> but harsh, critical, biased, bigoted, in spite of learning. And then all of a sudden, he is touched. And the moment that he comes to his senses again, he is no longer Saul of Tarsus, that harsh, cruel, persecutor of the Christians, learned in the law, but rather now he is St. Paul, a teacher, a healer, and above all things, whereas up to that moment he was so completely biased and bigoted in his Hebrew faith, all of a sudden he embraces the Gentiles. And his love for them is so great that he risks his own life to go out and share the good news with them. In other words, this a spirit has touched him. The spirit has touched him. He is no longer the same man. He is now a divinely inspired man. Moses, who is a shepherd, all of a sudden gives up his safety, security, risks his personal sense of life to go into Egypt and rescue the Hebrews. <clears throat> there is this spirit, and this spirit manifests itself 
as the new consciousness of the individual who has been touched by it. Whereas before, here is a housewife who all of a sudden becomes a healer, a businessman who becomes a healer, a doctor, a lawyer becomes a healer, a minister. Nature's change. You have an experience right here of one of your men of the island who was one of the plantation workers who is now a minister in a church on the big island. For years and years and years he, he was a plantation worker. But all of that is behind him and a new, a new man has been born in him with a whole desire to serve. Now, <clears throat> the reason that there is not more of this spirit abroad in the land is it cannot be used for any personal or selfish purpose. And this is what blocks us from experiencing it. There isn't anyone really, any thinker in the world, who wouldn't like some measure of that spirit that has been in our mystics, great philosophers. There isn't anyone in their right mind who wouldn't like to know the meaning of being inwardly at peace. And yet, there is a barrier. And the barrier is that the world is seeking it. The whole world is really seeking it, but for selfish purposes. Tens of millions of people go to church to pray for that spirit. But then they want a benefit from it. They want it to do something for them. They are not thinking of you. No, they are thinking of themselves, or at most, their family. And of course, this is the complete barrier to it. The spirit cannot be channeled. It cannot be used. It cannot be made to serve the purpose of anyone, even a noble purpose. It just will not serve a purpose. The fruitage of it, when it is attained, is that it establishes peace. Peace within ourselves first, peace then with each other, ultimately peace on as wide a scale as we wish to enlarge our consciousness. The first difficulty that we have in approaching this subject is that, first of all, we may be thinking of our health or our supply or our business or our race or our nation, and uh, we are in hopes that when we attain this, it will do something for them, and thereby we have lost it, because the spirit knows no difference between me and you, no difference between my race and thy race, or my nation and thy nation, or my business and thy business. Therefore, there is no way to go to it until within us we have come to a place of conviction 
that there is a spirit. This, this must come as a conviction individually. There is a spirit. I, I don't know its name or nature. But I know very well that something is keeping the fish and the sea and the birds in the air. Something is keeping two times two is four. Something is keeping the sun, moon, and stars in their orbit. Something is seeing to it that only apples come from apple trees and peaches from peach trees. There is a something. This must be the first conviction. There is a something. And this differs widely from believing that there is a God or having faith in a God. Because the world has been in trouble for 6,000 years of recorded history in spite of all the belief in God and faith in God. Belief in God and faith in God are two good ways to fool the human race. There must come something far beyond a belief or a faith, there must come a conviction, and that conviction must be based on something other than reason. There are many people in the world, atheists and agnostics, who know that there are laws of nature and that the sun, moon, and stars are maintained in their orbits and yet have no conviction that anything is doing it. The conviction that comes must be beyond reason. It must be something that touches us intuitively. And it is for this reason, undoubtedly, that we never make contact with it until that conviction has arisen in us, even when we have no reason for the conviction, no sensible reason, no reasoned reason. Now, <clears throat> Once the conviction has been attained, there is a something. I don't care whether you call it God or Christ or Jehovah. At the very beginning of my work, it was revealed to me that the word Christ and the word, the Christian word Christ and the Hebrew word Messiah were identical words. So it didn't make any difference what language you used. Now it has been discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls that this is absolutely true. The words used in the ancient Hebrew are the identical words that are used for Christ. Now, so you could call it Buddha if you like, Christ, Messiah, God. The name is meaningless because actually it has no name. Each one of us is entitled to give it any name that suits our particular fancy. A rose by any other name would smell just as sweetly. And uh, God, spirit, life would be the same regardless of by what name we identify it. Having this conviction, a question comes to my mind. Is it available to me? Is it available to man? Is it something of a practical nature?
Is it something that can be known in this incarnation or must we wait to pass on, die? These are all legitimate questions. And the person who cannot face themselves with these questions can miss the way. Because it is necessary not to appro approach this subject blindly or with blind faith or as if fearing to ask questions, but rather it is sensible to get the questions out of the way until we can arrive at the next question and that would be if this spirit is attainable how is it attainable well the moment we say if of course our mind goes to whichever of the masters we know did attain it and probably we have been led by then to some of the great literature that is available in the world mystical literature showing how many hundreds have attained it and then we have the answer yes it, it is attainable and it is attainable on earth it is attainable here and now next question is how fortunately we have a great deal of guidance in that direction we are told that Moses attained it in prayer on a mountaintop we discover that Solomon attained it in prayer. We read that Jesus had a natural gift of it, even as a boy, but for many years it wasn't known how it was developed until these latest discoveries, and now they know that from the time he was 12 until he was 30 that he lived in a monastery and was taught and uh, the spirit came forth in him in mighty measure we know that Saul of Tarsus spent years and years and years and years in spiritual study and religious study and then finally received it in a very exciting moment and so following many of the mystics we discover always that there was a certain time and a certain place in their experience when it happened but we notice also that even before that their interest was in that direction their thought was leading them in that direction in other words they must have had the same speculation going on in their mind as we have all had in ours and then eventually it came but this you might not gather from reading so I will tell it to you that in each case when it came it came when the individual was not seeking it for a specific reason beyond the reason of desiring it in other words all I want to know since God is may I know God aright and with no other motive there is no barrier the moment I think I must set my people free 
that barrier prevents it because in God there is no my people or thy people nor are there any right people or wrong people the moment I think of my health or my wealth my business my profession I have set up the barrier because the spirit does not exist for the purpose of my business The miracle, as some of you have discovered, is that in the measure of our attainment, it benefits our health and our business or our profession, but not ours at the expense of someone else's. Ah, there is the thing that you watch, that in attaining the spirit, you at the same time lose the capacity to wrong, harm, cheat, defraud another. In other words, the moment that this spirit is upon you, it brings receptive people into your orbit. But not that you can take advantage of them because it cannot function in that direction. To witness this at work I think of the birds in the air now these birds are sensitive and under ordinary circumstances they do not permit themselves to be too close to the human race and they must have invisible antennas But watch the difference when, without motive, you meditate in order to realize your oneness with the Spirit. Once you perceive the Spirit as the life, of all being human animal vegetable mineral because it is uh, natural not to have a desire to snare these birds there could be no motive in it really no benefit or profit in it it is a very simple thing to prove this because in the moment that you make your contact you will find the birds appearing and gradually getting friendlier and friendlier and friendlier and then you realize that it could only have come about because you had no ulterior motive Once you have perceived this, you can perceive why the man who trained the dog, Strongheart, had such great success in drawing to himself even the most ferocious of animals without danger. And always it was the same. Never did he have an ulterior motive or a design upon them. And eventually they, through their silent antennas, perceived it. So it is that in our human experience, you will discover that just as we can have relationships like this and that uh, some of you have witnessed now around the world that the reason is that there is no motive except the motive of sharing and this 
breaks down all of the barriers and draws us to each other from the farthest ends of the earth. So it is that in our business experience or profession, there is no possibility of failure. Once an individual has perceived their relationship to the spirit, because if they approach the subject, not with the idea of using the spirit or using those who may be led to them, but rather of sharing this whole world of the whole barrier of separation that now exists between men breaks down. The color barrier, the racial barrier, the religious barrier are humanly natural barriers that have been built up by men. They're artificially created, but they have been built up by men. And for this reason, every race, every religion, every nation, nationality, is born with some measure of fear of their next door neighbor. You can even find traces of it right now between the United States and Canada. Believe it or not, it exists there. Suspicion, fear. And certainly you know that it exists with foreign nations and more especially those whose language we do not speak and therefore whom we do not thoroughly understand. Now, these are not spiritually natural barriers. There is no such thing as a barrier in spirit. But these are natural human barriers because ever since the beginning of recorded history, nations have prayed one upon another. Races have prayed one upon another. Religions have fought one another. Until the most natural thing in the world is to bring children up with suspicion. And it's a suspicion that does not leave their mind unless individually they have a personal experience that wipes it out. Now, we deal first of all with individual you and me. We are in no position to save the world. We first have to save ourselves. And therefore, I have to take the stand as an individual, regardless of you or anyone else in this world. I have to take the stand as an individual that I can never be satisfied until I do have some communion with this invisible, whatever its name or nature. I can never be satisfied with just human relationships. I, I never can be satisfied until I know what lies beyond seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling. There is a world beyond and I definitely am not going to die until I know something about it. I take my stand. I tell no man about it because to the rest of the world it would be insane. And I make whatever efforts are necessary within myself. Or if I hear of a book that might help me, then I want to investigate that book. If I hear of a teacher that might help me, I must investigate that teacher. I must do something until I break through the barrier. Looking back, 
Do you know that living like a human being is living like a prisoner? Here you are bottled up inside of your mind and your body and you have no access to anything greater. And you're at the mercy of somebody who has a stronger body or a stronger mind. You're at the mercy of society. You're at the mercy of all of the influences of human experience. And here you are, bottled up in your mind and body, and no access to anything beyond that. And how do you get out of that prison? How do you get out of this limited sense of life? But you learn to tell no man and from the first time that you discover an honest book or an honest mystic, you learn that what you're seeking is to be found within you and that all that anyone else can be is a help, but that no one can take the place of you yourself. And therefore, regardless of how much help you get, there still remains the full responsibility upon you to go within because it isn't the holy mountain that gives it to you it isn't the holy temple that gives it to you it isn't the holy book that gives it to you you know there are lots of people with a tremendous faith in the Bible that the Bible can do it and what they must be going through now when they hear the thousands and thousands of statements in the Bible will have to be taken out because they were incorrect. It must be an awful shock to them if they survive it. Because it isn't the book. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. It's within you. And sooner or later, you must come face to face with it in your own inner meditation and be sure of this that it will not take too long if if you can go in there wholly pure no ulterior motive no outside desires just to know him aright To commune with that inner spirit not to use it as a power for someone or over someone not to gain an advantage through it to know it aright and then when you discover it you discover when you have the experience you discover that it really takes in the universe of men and women. There's no longer a barrier and there's no longer a capacity to be other than brother and sister, mother and father, son and daughter, to each other. When it says we are all one in Christ Jesus, all it means is that we are all one in the spiritual relationship of one spiritual household. The spirit exists as a transcendental presence and power and it exists within the consciousness of individual man. Its function is to reveal, yes, first of all, reveal the oneness of all men. Regardless of what island or continent they were born on, or what flag they were born under, 
or what particular color was given to them. The first thing this reveals is oneness, one life, one spirit, one soul, one being, one interest. Another function, it establishes in the revelation of this oneness, it establishes peace because it has eliminated the reason for discord. Now here's the mystery. Our five physical senses without this spiritual endowment sees the strangest kind of pictures. It sees materialistically and this means divisively. It sees more and less. It sees mine and thine. It sees good and evil. And yet, the same physical senses, once consciousness has been touched by that spiritual communion, those same eyes see only and hear only and taste, touch, and smell only lovingly. In other words, in oneness, in union and being. The touch of the spirit takes from us the materialistic view. Well, now, let us see what that materialistic view does to us. You have been reading lately about the 20% of the population in the United States that is poverty stricken. Probably there's no way for you to conceive in your mind how that can be because you know that every warehouse from Maine to California is so filled and laden with food and cotton and all of the rest of the things needful for society that it could supply not only that one-fifth but it could supply five-fifths and that it has been paid for mostly by the government so that it would take nothing from anyone's pocket to share it with that 20% of the people. But material sense says, oh no, we can't do that because, you see, that would compete with a man on the corner who has it for sale, but we can't interfere with his business. So we must let this 20% starve and freeze because that would take from the profits of our neighbor if we were to give that away. But in this materialistic view, do you think that it enters anyone's thought that this 20% are poverty stricken because they haven't any incentive to live or to work? They are experiencing man's inhumanity to man. They know what is in the warehouse. They know what's in storage and they know why they are not getting it. And therefore, their reaction must naturally be, why, why, with four-fifths of a nation as cruel as this, why should I even make the effort to survive or to benefit anyone else? Whereas, giving them 
their needs from this surplus would at the same time give them an incentive to live, an incentive to love their neighbor instead of hating their fellow citizens. Do you see that the moment the spirit touches you, you have to share. You, you couldn't possibly pass a poverty-stricken family, regardless of what it was going to cost you, nor would you stop to say, oh, but that'll take business from the corner grocer. He isn't going to get that business anyhow. It changes the nature. So the function of the spirit is to change the nature of the individual so that he thinks, sees, hears, tastes, touches, and smells spiritually. The spirit doesn't destroy a human being. It doesn't annihilate human love. It endows it with spiritual capacity so that we soon discover what it means that to lay down one's life for a friend is something noble, not taking the life of another to save our own. Thank you 